So um, I'm going to be talking today about using Docker for workshops and tutorials. So in the open source community, a lot of times what we need to do is we need to teach a lot of people how to do things. But in general, we end up in environments that we don't have control over. And there are various things that can go wrong. And I'll talk about several of the things that went wrong for me so you don't have to run into them yourselves. So what I ended up doing was using Docker in various different ways to create the environment that people need to use to explore the workshop without getting frustrated. And we went from an hour and a half getting Windows boxes to do what it is that we wanted them to do down to about 10 minutes. So um, it's, it's just frustrating and, and that's not what we want for a workshop. We want people to have a good time. So who am I? I'm Princess Polymath. Uh, as you can see, I don't put a lot of words on my slides. I like pictures because otherwise I read the slides to you, you read the slides, we read together. It's story time. Everyone goes to sleep. But I do promise that I will make a blog post with this content if anybody in here wants it uh, before the end of today. So you can go through it. You can actually follow along. I, it's designed to be sort of a workshoppy thing so you can see how it's going to work. And I, I don't mind if you use your computers and play along. And uh, my website is princesspolymath.com. And my Twitter is Synedra. So I will tweet out to the uh, OSB 15 if I do that blog post so that you guys can find what you're looking for. So the challenge, like I said, you go, you have a workshop, people bring their laptops. Some of them have Linux, that's pretty easy. <laughs> Some of them have Mac, that's usually pretty easy, especially as I use Python, Python is on all of the Macs. And some people have Windows. I, I did have a Chromebook once. That was a problem. <laughs> There's not much I can do for that person. But uh, and 32-bit Windows systems are also challenging. And I'll talk about how I worked around that particular problem. So, and, and the other thing is that some people who have Windows boxes don't have administrative privileges on them. So if you're like, OK, install Python now, they're like, I, I can't. I'm stuck. So, and then, then there's systems that people are using for their own development. They may not want your version of requests on their system. They may not want to put the, uh, the authentication for your API or whatever it is that you need in order to teach them. They may not want that on their system itself. People, some people are very particular about the things that install, are installed on their system natively. So Docker allows you to give them a little tiny virtual machine that has all of the things that they need in order to participate in the workshop. And later, they can install that stuff on their own system at, at their own pace. So instead of having to do it under the gun right now, five minutes, get it going, and make a decision as to whether that's the right thing, you can use the Docker installation. And they can always grab the Docker container later and put it on whatever system they want. So the result of all of these things is time and frustration. Like I said, hour and a half, that's, that's, that's the, that was my record, how long it took to get a room full of eight people <laughs> to, to be up and running on the workshop. And it was horrifying because some people took five minutes and so they were bored. And the people who took an hour and a half felt terrible. And so they were all, it, it was just not a good experience. So what do we want? We want a consistent environment where everyone can run exactly the same thing. It looks the same to them. It works the same for them. They're all running this little Linux box. And the commands that you tell them to do are going to work exactly the way that you're talking about. So we're not ta they're not having to deal with the setup problems. They're simply learning about what it is that you're trying to teach them. So that's consistency. So enter Docker. So who here has used Docker before? So some of you. So Docker is a teeny weeny little virtual machine. It's Linux. And it runs natively on, on Linux. Uh, it runs on Macintosh. And it also now runs on uh, Windows as well. So there's a boot to Docker sort of it, it installs VirtualBox so that you can use those virtual machines. And once it's there, you can create a Docker file that tells it exactly what needs to be included on that Docker uh, container and what commands it should run. So for instance, I have a, 
uh, a set of API sample code for, for our APIs at Akamai. And one of the things you need to do is run setup.py. So with a Docker file, I can say, install all of these, app get all of these things, go into the directory that has the setup.py and run it. So now when the people get onto the Docker, they just have to start running the sample code. They don't have to do any kind of setup at all. And I'll show you what Docker files look like and how you can use them. So it's a consistent system. Everyone has Linux. The libraries are all the same. So one of the problems you can have is somebody can have a request library that's older and you need requests for your HTTP calls, but the version that they have is not correct. Setup.py will take care of that, but again, now we have more installation. So it's an easy setup. <laughs> and it has full capability. You're basically root on this system, this tiny little incy wincy system that can only do one thing. Uh, you're root on it. So you don't have any problems with permissions. You can add no more things. You can run Vim or Emacs or whatever it is that makes you happy. Um, and you have full capability to do whatever you need on the system. Docker is actually even more powerful in more general terms in that it can share uh, directories with your main system. It can expose ports so you can run a web service on it. I don't do that in this particular case because we're trying to be simple. What I have for the example for this particular talk is a, a very tiny little um, node.js server with a little tiny JavaScript file, uh, index.html on it. So it's, it's super teeny, doesn't do anything very exciting, but it sort of demonstrates to you how exactly the container works. So that's the, the simple node REST API with a basic JavaScript front end. So first, we're gonna go to GitHub, and I'm gonna sit because it'll be easier. Um, so if you go to GitHub and you go to Synedra, that's my Twitter handle and also my GitHub handle, and you go to Docker demo, you're going to want to fork that to your own repository. And I'm going to slow down a little bit so that people can play along if they want to. Yeah. So I'm going to show you guys what the Docker file looks like. By the way, my, my, uh, the slides that I make are from Haiku Deck. I don't know if any of you have used Haiku Deck before. Um, it's an iPad application where you type in your headline and your subhead, and, uh, and it goes and it looks for keywords that match the, the stuff you've typed in, in Flickr, that are Creative Commons. And then it puts the attribution on the slide for you. So there's actually a Creative Commons button, and then if you export it to PowerPoint, it puts the attribution at the very bottom of the file. So you're always giving credit where credit is due, and it's pretty. <laughs> so let's see, I'm gonna be Sinedra. Oh, look at that. You're all forking, that's awesome. <laughs> so the Docker file, I'm going to sort of talk through this to give you an idea. Um, there are different OSs that you, can, that you can base things on. I used Ubuntu 15.04 because it has the correct version of Python. Uh, Python recently, between 2.7.6 and 2.7.9, they made a change because of the open SSL problem that happened recently. So if you try to make HTTPS calls, yeah, it is warm. <laughs> uh, I should spray all you guys. With some, I have a mister. <laughs> um, so if you try to make calls with 276 that are HTTPS, you get a scary warning. Not good for workshops. So I upgraded to 1504. So I'm adding a directory, and I'm telling it this is where I want you to be. So this is basically a change directory into that directory. Um, AppGit, it grabs the, uh, the node repository, from the node repository, and then it installs. It install, installs Express, and then it runs npm install, and it exposes 3000, which is the port where the, the HTTP server is going to run. So 
As you can see, there's a lot of different functionality that you can add. In the API examples that I have, like I said, my working directory is examples slash Python. And in that directory, I run setup.py. And I throw the people right in the examples Python directory so they don't have to look at all of the other stuff in there. Um, so that means that they can just type Python sample code and it all works. So does anybody have any questions about the Docker file? It just magically works. Oh, we have to, we're, we're not there anymore. Okay, if you don't have GitHub, you can get an account, super easy. Okay, so now we're gonna go to hub.docker.com. And on hub.docker.com, it's okay if you don't have a login because you can log in with GitHub. Oh, you used to be able to log in with GitHub. Oh, is it at the bottom? It wasn't on mine. Probably it's a Safari problem. Oh, no, uh, sorry, bottom of that first uh, line blue thing. Right next to this. Oh, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. I didn't check my password today. We may get to do this a couple times. I'm guessing not now. Oh, hey, look at that. They let me have my crappy little password. So. <laughs> so you're going to add a repository. Now, you can add a repository, which is a regular old repository, and it won't do any magic for you. But if you add an automated build, what it's going to do is every time you commit to that GitHub repository, it's going to recreate that container for you. So if you are uh, absent-minded, like I am, then it's fantastic for it to do this for you. You play with your code, you deal with your code, and then magic, the container is updated. So you're gonna add an automated build. And since you logged in with GitHub, you say GitHub, and it says, hey, look at that, you have all of these groups that you are in. Which one do you want? So, Pick the Docker demo. I'm just going to have two. It's all good. So it runs through the Docker file? Yeah, so basically it's going to pull the repository, it's going to run through the Docker file, and then it's going to create the container. So it doesn't run through the, through the Docker file um, at the time that the person pulls it. It just pulls the file system and all of the things that you've already done. So it creates that build at the time that you check in a file to GitHub it says, oh, hey, there's a, there's, there's a commit. I need to rebuild it. And so it builds it. And if it fails, it'll tell you why. So, yeah. Well, it does take a little while to pull the Docker um, images now. And, and sometimes, if you're, for instance, in Tokyo, uh, where everybody has MiFi, uh, thumb drives are your friend. You can put those, uh, those containers. You can even put Docker, boot to Docker on the... Um, on the, the thumb drive. So I'm going to call it public. Sorry, I'm not trying to be difficult. <laughs> and, and when active, we will build when new pushes occur. Oh, I already used that one, too. Creative, isn't it? So now you can go to the build details. And it's going to show you the build details. It's building. And then here's my, my amusing version of what happens next. So you sign in with GitHub, you create the new repository, and then you wait. Sometimes you wait some more. Docker is open source. It's, uh, it's not always super speedy. Sometimes it builds it in five minutes. Sometimes it takes a few hours. Um, that's just the queue is big and everybody shares it. So let's set up your system for Docker while you guys are all building your, your uh, container. Um, boot to docker.io. Boot to <laughs> docker.io. It's a two. And then you'll get the um, the 
basically it's a framework that allows, it, it installs VirtualBox and then it installs sort of a little tiny framework so that Docker will work on your system. Nice unicorn horn, by the way. <laughs> have you already got uh, VirtualBox installed? Should still work. Should still work. However, if you are, if you run into any problems, I will, I, I'm going to talk now through some problems that I've run into so that you guys don't run into the same kind of problems yourselves. I have had issues where the network will not allow SSH on port 22. So I created a digital ocean Linux box um, and I gave people the root password to log into it because it, all it does is run Docker. So they can run Docker and they get their own container and each of them can log in as root and they can run it. Um, I've seen problems where people already have VirtualBox installed. Same thing, I just give them a remote server to play with. Because the problem will be resolvable. You can probably Google it. Someone on Stack Overflow has the answer, but you don't have to do it right now. It'd probably take you 10 minutes to fix it, but you don't want to get behind and you don't want to be that guy who's making everything go slowly. So, <laughs> so. It is, but I have to take it down after the workshops. Sure, yeah. Like so, how but, many can you handle? Oh, I can handle as many as is, are in a workshop. I mean, it's, 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 it's not very right, yeah. resource intensive. The problem, however, is that my goal is to get it running on your system so that you can play with it later. Sure. Because I have example code for 12 different APIs, and I go through them fairly quickly because I talk fairly quickly, and not everybody's interested in every single piece. but so I don't want to have them have to use the remote server, but it's there so that they can play along uh, in, the, in the case of it. So if anybody has a problem in here, I will give you the login for my, my, Docker, my Docker droplet. <laughs> and that's actually something that I strongly recommend is have an, a remote system that people can log into. And open port 443 for SSH, because then people can actually log into it even if their IT department doesn't want them to go anywhere or do anything. So once you've set up your system for Docker, you're gonna pull the container. That is, that's all lowercase actually, I should have picked a different font. It's Docker, well, okay, so first you're gonna do boot to Docker init. Then you're, or if you actually, if you click on the, app, the application in your applications directory, it'll do all of this for you. But if you do boot to docker init, then boot to docker start, then docker run dash i dash t, Synedra or whatever your username ended up being, docker demo slash bin slash bash. So that says, I want an interactive shell. I want you to start bash on it. Because of the nature of docker, you can actually start a service that you never interact with or just log into it later. But in this case, we're trying to look at the code. We're trying to see how things work. So that's why we're running bash, is so that we end up with a login on the system. But I want you to be aware that that is optional. It's not a thing that you need to do. So once you do that, it'll start pulling the container. When you pull the container the first time, it takes a little bit longer. It has to pull the file system, has to pull all the things, has to pull the stuff that you put on the file system. And, but the second time you run it, it'll be faster. If you do update the container and you have people do a Docker pull to get the new version, it will only update the pieces of the container that are different from the version of the container that you have. So you don't have to go through the whole shebang again. You just, it just does the right thing, which is to pull the pieces that have changed. Are those um, options that Everything is lowercase. Sorry, need a new font. So it happens when I make my presentations at 3 o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> okay, so that's the general setup of the, yeah, I'm, I'm way, behind, way ahead, sorry. Um, but if you guys have questions, I'm happy to answer them. And uh, I was going to do it all, all in inter interactive, but some people don't have computers. So do you guys want me to write this stuff as a blog post? Does anybody want me to blog, write this stuff as a blog post? <laughs> okay, so I will write this stuff as a blog post and 
I will, uh, it will be on Princess Polymath, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll post it to OSB 15 as well, so you can find it, so you don't have to follow me if you don't want to. Um, but I strongly recommend that you guys think about this sort of thing. How many of you have tried to do workshops and run into the same kind of problem? Have you, yeah, so you, what kind of problems have you run into? Oh, it's the, the same sort of setup problem. Yeah. Yeah, and Docker's fantastic for that. Um, you, can, you can expose different files, you can expose services to each other. So you can link two Docker containers together so you can have your MySQL and you can have your web and you can have your, and you can have your um, intermediate. Right? You can have all of the services running and talking to each other. And you can just interact with the one that, that is the front end. Uh, you can, so you can link them together, you can, um, you, it's very powerful. The problem I find with Docker is that all of the people who tell you how to run Docker tell you how to do very complicated things with Docker, as if that is all that you can do with Docker. This use case, super simple. Right? I just want a little tiny Linux box that does one thing. And so, you know, if you're trying to set up a development environment or teach someone else at your company or in your open source group, like if you want to give them a working system and say, here, go then you don't have to go through, well, I have a different version of the, of the command line, um, and you just don't end up with that particular problem. Yeah, so. I've done the same kind of thing, but I used Baker, and passed out the Baker file. The problem there is everybody trying to download right. the image. Well, it's, it's, it's very, and like I said, the droplet is a fantastic idea, right? So DigitalOcean's $5 a month for a teeny weeny little system. Well, all you need is a teeny weeny little system. You're not doing anything very interesting. So um, you can just give out the, the root password and people can go crazy and do the one thing that you've enabled on the box. <laughs> and then everyone's up and running in five minutes. Everybody can get through SSH if you just change the port. <laughs> and it's secure still. You know, it's a secure port. It's just not really designed for that. That's cool, whatever. So the DigitalOcean allows you to have a remote server yeah, so that what do you, put in there? A, a, you can run Docker on it. So basically you can run, if, if, if for some reason, so sometimes VirtualBox on Windows interferes or they have VBox on their system and that interferes okay. or they don't have virtualization turned on or they have a 32-bit system. Um, so there's lots of reasons why Docker won't work. So this is an alternative so you don't have to say, wow, you don't get to play. You have to pair up with someone else um, because that makes people sad. <sighs> My goal is not sad people. So um, I, I strongly recommend that you have that fallback so that you're not stuck if somebody is stuck. And they'll be able to fix it. Like I said, they, they will be able to Google and figure out how to get Docker to run another system. It'll just take them a little while. And like I said, that having it installed locally is better because then they can continue to play with it later. And you don't have to leave a server up, which your IT department says you have to take down. <laughs> so anyways, sorry this was short, but I hope you guys learned good stuff. And I will write that blog post, post it out. And if you have any questions, please ping me. Ask me, send, send a tweet to me, or um, it's also my, my Twitter handle at gmail.com is my, is my email address. So if you want, if you have hundred more than 140 characters worth of things to say, uh, you can use the the old SMTP to to get to me. So thanks very much.